Today on From His Heart, Pastor Jeff Shreve concludes his timely series, We Are Soldiers, with a candid message about what the life of a good soldier for Christ is supposed to look like. Learn how to be bold, courageous, and effective, living your life in the Lord's Army. How are we to live life as a good soldier? Paul said to those in Philippi, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, he summed up his letter this way, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I have often told you and now tell you even weeping that there are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to himself. Paul shares three essentials to hear from the Lord at the end of your life, to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant, to be a good soldier for Christ Jesus. Three essentials, things that you need to know and things that you need to do. It's the how. How are we to live life as a good soldier? Three essentials. First essential, we are to walk with the Lord. How, how am I to do this thing called being a good soldier? Well, you walk with the Lord. Verse 17 again. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Did you know that's one of the favorite things of the writers of the epistles? They talk about walking with the Lord. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, Colossians 2, 6 says, so walk in him. Walk is very important. It's used 27 times in the, in the epistles. Now, a walk with the Lord, that means how you behave, how you conduct yourself, how you live. And it's a, it's a great word because that is our relationship with Jesus. It starts the moment that we receive Christ as Savior and, and Lord, uh, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. And it's a moment by moment, step by step, walk with Jesus Christ. That's the Christian life. So to be a good soldier, you walk with the Lord. And Paul said, follow my example and then observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Walk after them. And Paul said to the Corinthians, be imitators of me and follow after me because I'm following after Christ. And if you're walking in the same direction I'm walking, then we're both walking with the Lord and we're going onward and upward in our relationship with the Lord. Well, I want you to notice some things about this walk with the Lord. First of all, it's a wonderful walk. It's wonderful to walk with the Lord. Don't ever get the idea that Christianity is like taking bad medicine to get well. You know, I mean, you're thinking, well, uh, gosh, I heard the gospel, and I know that if, if you don't have Jesus in your life, that uh, you're going to die and go to hell. That, that's part of the gospel. You're in trouble without Jesus. And so you hear that, and you say, man, I don't want to go to hell, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold my nose and somehow uh, drink down this thing called Christianity, this thing called a relationship with the Lord, because, you know, it, it's just it's awful, but I have to have it. That's not Christianity. Christianity is a wonderful life with the Lord. Bill Bright in The Four Spiritual Laws, law number one, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, some people have taken issue with that, and they say, well, you know, uh, you shouldn't tell people that God has a wonderful plan for your life. I had a guy email me that. 
he was all upset because I said, well, you know, I agreed with Bill Bright. God does have a wonderful plan for your life. He said, well, what about people that get killed? What about people for their faith? What about people that have cancer? What about people that have this, have that, have this happen, that happen? Uh, God doesn't have a wonderful plan for their life. I said, well, your definition of wonderful and mine uh, obviously are different. To walk with God and to have a wonderful walk with God doesn't mean you're not going to have trouble. It doesn't mean you're not going to have sorrow. It doesn't mean you're not going to experience loss in this life, loss of loved ones. If you live long enough in this life, you're going to experience all that stuff, and you're going to have loved ones die. And you might even experience the tremendous blow of having a child die. And God, there's nothing in the Bible that says, well, God is, uh, he is compelled to, to keep his little darlings from any kind of uh, adversity and any kind of problem. He never says that. You are going to have trouble in this world. Jesus made that clear. In the world, you have tribulation. But be of good courage, I have overcome the world. And so the wonderful part is when I receive Christ, he comes to live inside my life. Hey, it's a wonderful walk because it's a walk with God, and he never leaves you and never forsakes you. And secondly, it's a life-changing walk, a life-changing walk with the Lord. The Scripture says in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And the moment that you receive Christ, your life changes. Now, when it's genuine and true, there's an instantaneous change inside. Because the Scripture says that you pass from death to life. You, it, the, the, Christianity is the great exchange. Uh, when I prayed at 17 years old and asked Jesus to save me, I gave my life to him. He gave his life to me. The greatest exchange in all of the universe is that exchange. And I became, I went from being a child of the, the devil to being a child of God. And I was born again by God's Spirit. And my life changed instantly on the inside on the inside. We call that justification, where the Lord declares, because you put your faith and trust in Jesus, that you are uh, just as if you've never sinned. You are completely righteous in God's sight. And there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is a wonderful transformation that takes place. But that's on the inside. It takes time for that to show up on the outside. And just as your a little baby comes into this world, they come into this world, they can't do anything. My brother-in-law used to tell me when I first started having kids, you know, I mean, I, I was one of those guys, little babies. I'm just not a little baby guy. You know, I love them, but I love them when, from afar. Uh, they're not doing a whole lot until they get a little, they're able to kind of move around. And then, man, when they got to be about uh, a year old, I just loved my kids because you could do more with them. And uh, so here we are as a baby Christian. Well, we don't, we don't, we're not able to do a whole lot. We're just growing in this thing called Christianity. But real Christianity is life change. It starts immediately at justification, and then it goes day by day, month by month, year by year in this process called sanctification. It's the process of Christ-likeness. Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth, takes out his hammer and takes his chisel, and he starts to work on you and me to make us like himself. If you are not experiencing life change on a regular basis, something is wrong in your Christian life. John the Baptist, he summed up his ministry this way when Jesus came on the scene, and it's a, it's a great verse for us that describes what we are supposed to be about in our sanctification process in our Christian life. He said in John 3, verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. So the Christian life is that the Lord would increase in me, that, that he would be more and more and more uh, in control of me, and that the old me would decrease. And so when I'm around people, all of a sudden they notice, hey, you're different. 
There's something different about you. And the Scripture says that the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him goes forth in every place we go. And all of a sudden, people can tell, man, what is it about you? You don't get mad like you used to. You don't talk like you used to. The, the vulgarities that used to spill out of your mouth, they, they're not there anymore. You don't, you don't uh, gossip like you used to. There are just changes that take place, and that doesn't ever stop. Paul said that we uh, are transformed from glory to glory, and the Lord continues to work on us and chip away at us and make us what he wants us to be, and that never stops. Paul himself, who was probably the greatest Christian who ever lived, he said in Philippians chapter 3 that the desire of his heart was to know him, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And that's what drove him on. He said, I press on toward the, the goal of the upward prize of God in Christ Jesus, and I keep, uh, keep pressing forward to know him, to grow in him, to be like him. See, the Christian life, this walk, it's not a destination. It's a journey. And it doesn't ever end until you get to heaven. And we're constantly being changed by the Lord. So here's the question. Is your life changing? Now, everybody do this for me. Hold out your hand like this. Be good for you, little aerobics. You hold out your hand like this. We're talking about how do you do this thing called Christianity. Well, you remember your five, your four fingers and your thumb. This is critical for your growth in the Christian life. Your thumb is Bible study. You have to spend time with God and listen to his word. It, it, the Bible says that the, the word of God is our milk, it's our meat, it's our bread. You're not going to be strong unless you're eating. Bible study. Second is prayer. Bible study, God talks to me. Prayer, I talk to God. I'm going to have to uh, grow in my prayer life in order to grow. Thirdly is worship. I have to worship the Lord. I was made for worship, and I need to worship Him. That is critical. The fourth one is fellowship. I need other believers around me. And, you know, we come to this service, and it's a worship service, but that's not necessarily a lot of close fellowship because we're just kind of participating as we sing and things like that, but we're not necessarily talking to a lot of people. And so this is worship, but it's not fellowship. Fellowship is small group. Fellowship is getting together with a, a class of uh, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, whatever it might be, but where you're able to talk and develop relationships with people. We all need that. So Bible study, prayer, worship, fellowship, and witness. Witness. Shine for Christ. Share his story. Share what God has done in your life. You need those five things in order to grow so that your life will change, and you can never cut one out. You can never say, well, I don't need to do this one. I, I, I've read the Bible before. I don't need to do that one. You know, I'll let other people pray for me. You, no, you need all five of those things. I need all five of those things, and we need to grow in those five things. It's a life-changing walk with the Lord. We are to walk with the Lord. Second essential, we are to be wise with opposition. Now, this is something that you need to know in order to uh, be the good soldier God wants you to be. You're going to have opposition in the walk, and the devil is going to be working against you in the walk, and the devil will use people to work against you in the walk. He says in verse 18, for many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. There are those, Paul says, many, who are enemies of the cross. I'm walking with God. I've received Christ as Savior and Lord. I'm a brand new person on the inside. I'm justified. Now I'm living out my justification in what the Bible calls sanct or what theologians call sanctification, and I'm setting myself apart to walk with the Lord, but I'm hitting opposition. And the opposition comes from those who are enemies of the cross. 
Now, when you think about the enemies of the cross, you say, well, who's he talking about, enemies of the cross? Well, I think you could put the enemies of the cross in three categories. One, uh, the, the first one is a very obvious one. It's the people who hate the, the idea of God. They hate the idea of salvation. They hate the idea of Jesus and the cross and that man would need a Savior. They, they just hate all that stuff. They're the, uh, the, the da Richard Dawkins, the famous atheist, people like that that just say, that's all just bunk. This book is, is a bunch of lies, and we don't believe in any of it. There's a poem that was written some years ago by a man who felt like that. It says this, I fight alone and win or sink. I need no one to make me free. I want no Jesus Christ to think that he could ever die for me. Enemies of the cross. I don't need the cross. I hate the concept of the cross because the cross screams out that you're a sinner and you need a Savior, and you can't save yourself. That's why God had to become a man and die for you. That's the only way for you. And people who are humanistic and people who think that they're good enough, well, they bristle at the idea of the cross. So you have those who are out and out against the cross, whether it's active, shaking my fist in the face of God, or whether it's passive, just saying, yeah, I don't, I don't really care about any of that. As one young guy told me, he said, yeah, I'm just not into the religion stuff. Yeah, it's just not interesting to me. So he's an enemy of the cross because he doesn't want to have anything to do with the cross. Cross is the most important thing in God's whole uh, economy is the cross. So many people are enemies of the cross, and all people outside of Christ are one heartbeat from hell. Whether you're uh, an out and out against the Lord and against the Word, or whether you're a legalist who's trusting in works, or whether you're uh, a libertine who says it doesn't matter, this is just wonderful, I can sin all I want because it doesn't matter. Every person outside of Christ is one heartbeat from hell. And Paul said, I tell you even weeping that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. It broke his heart. Because he said their end is destruction. I see where these people are going. They're going to die and go to a Christless hell. Their God is their appetite. They glory in their shame, and they set their minds on earthly things. You know, when you think about the five fingers, five, four fingers, one of thumb, you think about the hand. All four, the first four of these things, you can do in heaven. I can hear God's Word in heaven, I can pray in heaven, I can worship in heaven, I can fellowship in heaven, I can't witness in heaven. There are no lost people in heaven. So the only thing that we can do on the earth that we can't do in heaven is witness. And that's why God's left us here, to be a witness. You shall be my witnesses. I was witnessing to a guy in college in the weight room. Aaron was his name. He was a Jewish guy, and I was talking to him about the Lord. He said, well, if heaven's so great, why doesn't the Lord just take you to heaven when you believe? I said, he has left me here, Aaron, to share with you. That's what I'm here for, is to tell you about Jesus who's mighty to save. Hey, we're here to walk with the Lord, and we are to be wise with opposition. And thirdly and finally, we are to wait for his return. He says in verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Verse 21, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. How do we do this thing called the Christian life? How do we do this walk with the Lord? How do we do it when it gets hard, when we run into opposition? How about when we get sick or our wife gets sick or our kids get sick or we lose our job or something devastating happens to us? How do we go on? How do you get through the hard times in life without totally derailing? Because some people, man, they run into a difficulty in life, and what do they do? They just say, forget it. I'm done with worshiping God. He didn't answer my prayer. He didn't come through. I quit. You know how you know you're really a Christian? When you throw in the towel, he throws it back. He doesn't let you quit. 
But some of you might be here and you might be ready to quit because you're mad at God because he's not doing right. You say, how do I keep going? For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how Jesus got through the cross? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He set the joy before him. That's the only way he could do it. That's the only way he could experience all that physical, emotional, spiritual pain to literally become sin for you and me. He set the joy before him. And you and I need to do that in the Christian life. We need to think that this is not all there is. And the greatest five words in the Bible, and it came to pass, didn't come to stay. And I can go through whatever I am going through because the Lord is with me. And he says, Jeff, it's going to be worth it on the other side. So just don't quit. Just continue to trust me. Set the joy before you. Hey, our Savior is coming again. I said, our Savior is coming again. Anybody excited about the Savior coming again? And he's coming to make things glorious for you and for me and for this world. That's why the Bible says that when he comes, see, we don't know when he's coming. He didn't tell us when he's coming. He could have told us exactly when he's coming. He could have given us a date and time. He didn't do that. He just said, I'm coming, I'm coming soon. You be ready. When, Lord? It's not for you to know times or epics. You just be ready. You be my witnesses. You be ready. We don't know when he's coming. I think he's coming soon. I could be wrong. He could be, maybe his coming is not for 100 years. Maybe it's not for 1,000 years. I, I look out at the world situation, and I think his coming must be soon. But I don't know. But I know this. If you ever get to the place where you say, well, I know he's not coming today, that's evidence that he might be coming today because at an hour when you think not, the Son of Man comes. So once you start thinking he's not coming, then he says, be careful because I come at a time when you don't think I will. So be ready. Your Savior is coming. Look up, be watchful, for your redemption is drawing near. And when he comes, when he comes in the clouds at the rapture, that's when the Bible says that the dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and we're changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. We're changed. And the body of our humble state... The body that is frail, the body that can't make it, the body that is uh, prone to sickness and disease and weakness, that is changed, and we're made like him. And you know, I told you that you never arrive in the Christian life. You're still fighting. You're still struggling with this thing called the flesh all the way to the end. When he comes, that's when it changes. That's when Christ-likeness is completed. That's when Christ-likeness is perfected, and you become just like him in holiness and in purity. And you have a body like his, a body that never wears out, a body that is never subject to decay. You're glorified. But not only does he glorify us, then he comes to set up his kingdom on earth and he removes the curse from the earth. And all of a sudden, the scripture says that the devil uh, blossoms like uh, the, 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 the desert, not the devil, the desert blossoms like a rose, and the lion lays down with the lamb, and the little child plays at the cobra's den, and they will not hurt, God says, in all my holy mountain. And the knowledge of the Lord fills the earth as the waters cover the sea. And Jesus is enthroned as King of kings and Lord of lords in Jerusalem. And that day is coming soon. We're talking about being soldiers in the Lord's army. And so the big question is this. Have you ever received Christ as Savior and Lord? You're not a soldier in the Lord's army till you give your heart and life to Jesus. And I want to help you do that. If you're watching and you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus, just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again from the dead on the third day. 
and I give you right now my heart and life. Come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins, make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you, and I will follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in, and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on your screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can help you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Today's message from Pastor Jeff Shreve, Life in the Lord's Army is available in multiple formats when you call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. Paul told young pastor Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You see, the moment we receive Jesus as Savior and King, we're placed in the Lord's army as soldiers and God wants us to be good soldiers. Good soldiers who don't quit even in the face of extreme opposition. Now, our faith is under major attack these days, and the devil is leading the charge. But as God's children, we're called to fight the good fight of faith and contend earnestly for the gospel no matter what. I wanna help you become a good soldier, especially in these times of struggle, by sending you my five message series, We Are Soldiers, and the companion booklet, The Lord's Army. I trust these two resources will help empower you to boldly stand for Jesus in these difficult days. For your gift this month to From His Heart Ministries, we'd like to send you the series, We Are Soldiers, and the booklet, The Lord's Army. Call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. And thank you for joining with us to reach the world with the good news of Jesus by investing in kingdom work through From His Heart. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real